If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that, yes, indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, there's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. And then when I turned 40, it's a natural age to sort of look back on your life and kind of start to take stock of what have I accomplished? What have I done? What have I not done? Welcome to Measure Twice, Cut Once, the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafters stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them. I'm your host, Susan Smith, coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm, Lucy, and I spend lots of hours doing freehand, edge-to-edge, doodling-type quilting. So if you're not a quilter and those terms mean nothing to you, it really is doodling on a quilt top with a 50-pound writing utensil. So if you've always wondered what that looks like when it's being done, or if in fact you are a long arm quilter and you just want to see the process in real time, I invite you to check out my YouTube channel. It's also called Stitched by Susan. And there I have episodes called Live and Unscripted, where I quilt an entire project from beginning to end, and it's unedited. And so you get to see thread breaks, needle breaks, everything. I I laughingly call it a reality show because it's all done in real time and it's all there. I talk about the decisions and the processes as I'm doing them. And in fact, if you're watching them live, you can chime in with your questions and I'll answer them while I quilt. So if you've ever wondered what that process looks like, once again, head over to youtube.com forward slash stitched by Susan and look for the live and unscripted events. Well, my philosophy is there's really nothing as warm and comforting as a handmade quilt. And it is so enjoyable to hear the stories of the makers behind those quilts. After all, quilting has been a bridge between generations. It has soothed loneliness and chronic pain. It's been an expression of art and creativity that has spanned countries and cultures. So today I've invited into my studio Victoria Newmeyer to tell us her story. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm The Will Half of The Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that myself and the eponymous Dave like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to Pins and Needles with a quick tip for all you sharp quilters out there. Today's tip comes to you from a long armor's perspective, but whether you are in fact the long arm quilter as I am, or whether you're the person who sends their quilts to a long armor to be quilted, either way you can find this helpful. So our tendency when we're folding something is to fold it directly in half. And when you're folding, for example, the backing of a quilt, often there is a seam right in the middle. And when you fold it in half exactly, guess what happens? That seam, which was pressed flat, is now folded back up again, undoing all the work that you did in pressing. So my tip is to fold it anywhere but right on that seam allowance. It can even be just an inch or two to one side or the other, helping to keep that seam laying flat. And again, whether you press your seams open or whether you press them to one side, still I know that you've pressed them flat. So just make those initial folds as best as you can just off the seam line. Your long armor will appreciate it. And if you are a long armor, pass on this tip to your clients because it can really save you extra headache in trying to get those seams to lay flat. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. You know, I love my coffee and on that website for the price of one delicious coffee, you can make a one-time contribution to help with the cost of producing this podcast. I do thank you so much for your support and maybe take a moment now to refill your coffee or teacup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. (music) 
I first met Victoria through her online fabric shop. It's called Midlife Quilter, and she'll tell us the story behind that name in her interview. But Victoria says it didn't take her long to become a fabric addict, who dreamt of turning her love of pretty quilting fabrics into a day job. Her shop's goals are really simple and wonderful. Number one, to sell beautiful fabrics, and number two, to provide excellent service. And I tell you what, if you scroll through Victoria's Instagram feed, she does indeed have beautiful bundles of fabric. So be sure and check that out. So welcome, Victoria. I am so glad to have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This is so fun. And you have to tell our listeners, by the way, where, where you're recording this and kind of why. It's such a great story. <laughs> so I'm recording for my car because my son, if he sees me behind a lock, it's, yeah, it's chaos. <laughs> Got to know what's going on, right? Oh, yes. He would be trying to bang the door down. So this was the safest place for me today. Well, I'm glad that you've outsmarted him for today. That's great. It may not last much longer, but... No. <laughs> so, Victoria, I've been following you on Instagram. That's kind of where I became a little bit acquainted with you. And I found your story so interesting because I'm, you know, I've been a quilter all my life. I learned alongside my mom who learned from her mom, et cetera, et cetera. And sewing and crafting did not come to you that way. How did it come into your life? Yeah, so um, it is interesting because a lot of the quilters I know... Uh, have a story similar to yours where they learned from their mom or their grandmother and I was never around sewing that way uh, we had some family friends who did it and it was always this the sewing machine was always this magical piece of equipment that I was always intrigued by but did not have anyone to teach me and uh, my mom is probably the least domestic mom <laughs> uh, even today as a grandma she'll take the kids to the candy store she won't bake cookies with them you know and she says I'm not the grandma who bakes that's what she's always telling us and I was the opposite growing up I wanted to bake and I wanted to sew and I wanted to quilt but I never really had anyone to teach me those things and then when I turned 40 I it's a natural age to sort of look back on your life and kind of start to take stock of what have I accomplished? What have I done? What have I not done? And sewing was the number one thing that I really regretted never having tried to do. And I'd never done it because I was intimidated because I didn't have anyone to show me and I didn't know how to use machine or anything. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to let this fear hold me back. I'm going to buy a machine. Uh, there's YouTube now That's and right. there's tutorials out there and I'm going to just try to learn. And if I don't know how to do it, I don't know how to do it. End of story. So I ordered my machine off of Amazon and it's actually funny. I mean, when I say I'd never used a machine, I'd never used a machine. I actually had asked my, like, I was trying to figure out how do you wind the bobbin? How do you get the, how do you get the thread so evenly? I thought you did it by hand. That's how, because <laughs> I literally did not know the machine did it for you. So with the help of books and YouTube tutorials and, you know, all those quilters out there who so generously share their knowledge, I just started learning to sew with really simple projects like pillowcases, anything with a straight line. And I just had, it's such a great thing to create and to see something you made with your own hands. And I was just immediately hooked. And the rest was history. I just took off and kept going and going and going and going. And uh, yeah, so it was just a, kind of a fulfillment of a lifelong dream. And it turned out that I stuck with it, which so was surprising to me too, because I had tried so many other crafts in the past and had never really, I don't know, I got bored with them after a little while. And never really showed much promise in them, but sewing was something that I just really took to. You sure did. And I just love that you found it so fulfilling because I know that's what drives crafters on so much is just that knowledge that I made it. Whatever the thing may be, I made it. That is so, so rewarding. And I think that's what makes us say, you know, quilting is our therapy. It could be cross stitches, your therapy it could be leather work, whatever. But making right. something with your hands is wonderful in all kinds of ways. That's mm -hmm. great. Okay, so how did that 
transform into owning a shop only two years later, not very much later. You just dove right in. I kind of did. Um, so what happened was in 2020, uh, the year of the pandemic, um, I had started doing some pattern testing for Sharon Holland, which I knew was a really huge opportunity. And um, in March or April, um, my husband's salary was pretty severely cut due to the pan, you know, due to the pandemic. So we were grateful he didn't lose his job, but it was a really big pay cut for our family. And I started to think, well, how am I going to continue doing my crafts and uh, be able to afford the fabrics I need to buy and also maybe turn it into something where I can help support my family down the road because all of a sudden having one income seemed scary. <laughs> mm -hmm. And before, you know, it, it hadn't felt that way before, but now I was like, I want to have an extra stream of income for down the road. So um, I took some of our savings and I invested it very carefully into some fabric and thought to myself, well, if nothing else, at least I can purchase wholesale and I can use that fabric for my projects. And at least I won't have to stop quilting because that was going to be a very real possibility due to the cut in our budget. And, but thankfully because of the networking I had already started doing, I was able to, um, you know, be able to sell the fabrics and I didn't have to just keep them all for myself. <laughs> and, Which is uh, tempting. It, yeah, it, it is tempting. I mean, it, now I'm just like, oh, you know, I wish I could keep more of it for myself. <laughs> but, um, but so it, it's been helpful. I mean, it's, I would say anyone who owns a fabric shop will probably tell you it's not a big money maker the first couple of years because you're building your inventory, you're, you know, building your audience, you're building your marketing. And that is true. But I still hope that within a couple of years, it will be something where I can at least fund my passion with it. Um, and, you know, maybe, yeah, eventually help support my family with it as well. That's my dream for it. Well, I tell you what, looking at your Instagram feed, you truly have an artist's eye. I just am all admiration for the bundles that you curate. You know, that's something that I struggle with, and I know lots and lots of quilters do. And you just really have a gift for that, and I appreciate that. Thank you. So recently, you published a series of blog posts that are called, let me just check my notes, How to Build a Proper Stash, and it's in four parts. Can you tell me a bit more about that and maybe just give us a little nutshell, a little taste that mm -hmm. yeah so I wrote that blog series because when I was first learning to sew and first learning to quilt I can distinctly remember being inside of a big box fabric store and being completely confused I had no idea where to go where to start and I felt so overwhelmed and I also felt that I kept feeling like I was buying fabric but then every time I would see a quilt pattern I wanted to make nothing I had went together. Mm -hmm. And it was really frustrating because it is not an inexpensive hobby. <laughs> but, you know, especially when you're first starting all the materials you need to buy, you know, rotary cutters, cutting mats and thread, and then you're continually going out and buying fabric and yet nothing matches. It was very frustrating. And I actually kept Googling, like, how do I buy fabric? How do I buy fabric? And there was nothing out there. And I thought to myself, if I ever get the hang of this, I'm going to write a series of blog posts to help others because it's help, It's going to be helpful for someone to have a guide when they're shopping for fabric. I agree so, completely. So wh where do you start? What are the first kind of foundational steps to making your choices? And this is, as you mentioned in your post, this is not about curating a bundle. This is about building a well thought out, useful stash. Right. Well, the first thing is you want to make sure that there's four different categories of fabrics that you have a good amount of each of them. Sometimes people gravitate towards solids and they have a lot of solids, but not enough prints, or they have a lot of prints, but not enough solids. So in my blog series, I broke it out into four different categories. The first was solids. Second was prints. The third was blenders. And the fourth was low volume prints. Because I feel like if you have enough of each of these prints at your disposal, it's going to be much easier for you to pull and curate a bundle from your own stash 
because it'll always stay balanced. So I, you know, in my, in my blog series, I go into more detail about how do you determine that, but I really feel like it's really easy to go into a store and get seduced by whatever you like the best. I, I love floral prints and I kept buying floral prints, but then you can't make a quilt with all different kinds of floral prints. You need something to tie them all together. So the whole point of my series is how to help you build a cohesive stash. That is really, really good advice. And I've never honestly thought of it that way because I know the kinds of things I like when I walk into a store. But you're right. If you buy everything within that parameter, then there's too much sameness and there's not mm -hmm. balance and interest. Great. Well, I'm going to go read all those blog posts in more depth because clearly I need the lessons you're teaching. <laughs> So I'm curious a little bit, because I'm an entrepreneur too, I'm curious how this plays out for having a business now at home. Like, is your whole family involved in it? Is it kind of a family affair or is it just something that you do? It's mostly something I do, but my family is extremely supportive and I wouldn't be able to do it if it weren't for their understanding. Um, anyone who runs their business as you do and you know, it takes up so much of your time that it's really easy to get that guilt that I may, maybe I'm putting too much time here and not enough time here uh, at home. And, but you know, my family is always so supportive of me and they're like, nope, you know, go do it. You need to do this. And uh, you know, my daughter who is, she'll be 18 in December. She'll always, you know, she sees I've got a lot going on. She'll be like, you know, can I help? Is there something I can do? And you know, my husband will wrangle our five-year-old so I can, concentrate on what I'm doing. So it's, it's not a family business in that they don't necessarily help me cut fabric or anything like that, but they're there to be my emotional support. And that is really, really important. It's, it's true. And it's kind of true too, that it's not possible to have a home-based business and not have it to some degree affect and touch all the members of your family. It just is that way when you're working from home. Um, yes. Another thing that I wonder about a number of people who have started shops online or, or in various ways started their own business find that over time, it kind of saps the joy out of what they're doing. Are you finding that you, you still make space or you still find the joy of creation? Or is this just something that augments it and you're finding that they both work well together? Um, it's something that I think I was a little caught off guard that it took up as much time as it did. I thought, oh, I've got this. I'm going to, I'll have time to make. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not going to be a big deal. And then a few months into it, I thought, gosh, it's been so long since I've made anything for myself. Like I'm working a lot of hours. I'm not fulfilling that bucket. And I got, you know, there was a, a period where I really was very burned out and felt really sad because I wasn't fulfilling that bucket. And I finally decided I'm one person and mm, I started really thinking like, why did I get into this and what brought me into this and realized I needed to maybe take some steps back and get back to the joy of it. Because I think if you start losing that joy, it will reflect in everything that you're doing. And I didn't want that. So I started saying no to pattern testing and things like that. Things that were maybe taking up extra time that I needed for myself to fill that bucket. And uh, since then, I've felt like that joy is coming back and I'm feeling fulfilled again. That's excellent. I think that's the most important question an entrepreneur should ask themselves is, why did I set out to do this? And I think you have to ask that question and keep coming around to it and around to it and around to it over time and keep assessing. Um, mm -hmm. I think a number of our listeners are kind of perhaps in the same boat that they're entrepreneurial too. And would you have any advice for them in terms of maybe some books they could read, podcasts they could listen to? I'm kind of springing this on you, but um, things that have been helpful to you in developing your business or your mindset or your marketing strategy or anything like that? Um, I'm not really sure I could recommend or suggest anything. I mean, you know, your podcast is great. Uh, I think I, I've heard really great things about Elizabeth Candy, Elizabeth from Quilters Candy, her podcasts and her uh, classes for starting your own business. Um, and I've uh, done a little bit of work with her as well. And I would say those are the two that come to mind, you know, right away. Uh, and 
you know, yeah. I mean, in terms of that, I would say those are the two things that come to mind. That's great. Kind of as we're winding down, do you have something I like to ask all my guests if they have a little uh, nugget of gold that they want to share with our listeners? So it can be a brief or a major, you know, aha moment, but something that your craft has really um, tr- shined the light on for you in your life. You know, I think what made me love quilting so much and sewing so much is that most of the time you can fix the mistake. And I feel that when you start to lose that fear of failure, it can really move you forward in so many ways. And I feel that it really taught me to let go of that fear. And when I was able to do that, I was able to do things that I don't think I ever would have done. If you had told me five years ago, you're going to have this Instagram presence, or you're going to have run a shop, I would have said absolutely not. And here you are. And here I am, because, you know, you just take that seam ripper, you fix it. (laughs) You make a mistake, it's no big deal. And often that's where creativity happens is in the surprises in the unexpected, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So before we go, tell our listeners where they can find you if they're interested in reading your great blog posts or in shopping in your online store. Yeah, uh, well, you know, my uh, my Instagram handle is midlife underscore quilter and my website is www.midlifequilter.shop and I can be found there. Okay. And I'll be sure to post links to your various uh, media places in the show notes so that folks can find you there. Well, thank you ever so much for coming into the studio and visiting with me today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. Well, that was an enjoyable visit with Victoria. I really hope you do check out her website where she's got her blog posts and particularly the series on choosing fabrics for your staff. She's got some really great advice there. So thank you very much for tuning into the show. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcast or whatever the podcast app you choose to listen on. It really helps other listeners to find the show. Also, I would love to hear from listeners who would like to nominate a crafter with a story to tell. To do that, just email me at info at stitchedbysusan.com. I'd sure appreciate it. So until next time, may your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted.